We have a full table of talent this evening as we record an edition of the KSO Show, brought to you by Tallgrass Tap House. Right now, we've got Chris Nelson sitting here, Grant Flanders is here, Mason Voth is here, KSU underscore fan. You know, it's the weird, the Boscos were just insisted on calling you fan underscore KSU, <laughs> like over and over again <laughs> in that intro, I thought that was a good time. Uh, John Kurtz is on the way, he's never been late to a show, so I don't know how we're gonna how we're gonna do this. Um we're going to record two shows tonight. Not going to mislead you guys, but this one we're going to do the regular show first. You're going to hear that on the site probably on Tuesday morning. And then we'll do KSO Retro, which is probably for Wednesday or so. We'll see how the production of that comes through. But first, you guys provided us a lot of questions. I'm going to kind of throw it open. I'll probably pick one guy to answer every question from this table here. But there'll be some disagreement. And so in Mason, Flando, Fan, Nelson, whoever, when you feel like something's been said that's just erroneous and ridiculous, come on here and talk about it. But we are sponsored, like I said, by the Tallgrass Tap House. So keep your responses you know, in line of something that, of a show that has very high high class sponsors. Mm-hmm. Okay, Can't I do wanna, it. I don't want to hear any lowbrow <laughs> stuff. So I'm going to start with KSU 59. To 21, 59 21, it says, Isn't that a score of like an old Oklahoma game? Real famous Oklahoma win or Nebraska win? I can't remember which it is. 59 21. I think it was <laughs> from Nebraska like, in the 60s. Yeah, something like, like that. Lynn Dickey? Like that? I think so. I don't know. We're going to find it. But I will so I'm going to ask this. I'm just going to throw this to Nelson first. It's a pretty open ended question. He asks, he or she asks, when does the honeymoon period end for the football staff? I don't know if they're in a honeymoon period right now to begin with, but I, the point of the question, so as a you know, fan slash journal guy, for you, when does this honeymoon period end and you start expecting something different than hope, you know, and these kind of things that you can be provided without, without a game being played yet? For me personally? Sure. Um, I would say um, after, after year one, um, you know, I... Certainly want some wins and would love for them to make a bowl game. But in this this first season, I'll be looking more for improvement throughout the year and them kind of establishing their identity of who they are and things like that. Be able to, you know, establish a running game as well as a um, bit will throw the ball off the play action pass. And if they do those things and establish an identity, then, then I'll consider it a success. Anyone feel totally, totally different? I, I'm not like completely different, but I think the honeymoon ends after game three at Mississippi State. I just think... Fans seem like they're going to be understanding, but once football games actually start getting played, people are just going to change their mind, and they're probably going to lose by a couple scores against Mississippi State, and people will just start to freak out from that point on and think, oh, the sky is falling, when in reality, it's probably not, but that's when the honeymoon ends. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. That's why I asked for me personally or in general, because right. I be do think for, for in general it'll be much earlier than that after the first oh, yeah. loss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah. I don't have anything I different. So. I'm going to ask Fan this one. Uh, he notes it's difficult to follow a legend in any sport. Um, and again, this is an opinion question. Like, what's the percent chance of success for the staff? And I know, for one, that is a whole other question of what is success. But if we're just going to say that we can agree on whatever that is, what's the percent, the, the percentage chance this staff succeeds? I'd, I'd give them 60, 40, 70, yeah. 30, something like that. I think they've got a good chance because I think they've got a good uh, program that they're inheriting. Even though the roster's got issues, I think they're still inheriting a pretty good program, right? With a chance to win some games in this league, so I'd, I'd give them a decent chance over the next ten years, eight, uh, seven, eight years, however long they are here. Uh, that's a whole other. I mean, that the, there's so many factors that go in that question. It's hard to really oh my, judge yeah. it. But but if you think in average seven, eight wins over six years, I think they've got a good chance of that. And I think it's interesting to note, too, you said they, they're inheriting a good program. And I, th- I think that's true. I think there's a lot of criticism, and rightfully so, from myself and from us about the roster and that kind of things. But but as you just kind of verbalized, those can be two different things. I yeah. mean, the program, as much as last year was frustrating, has still gone to Bulls, what, eight, eight, nine, ten of them? Yeah. You know, uh, all, every year but one, except from last year. So what's one that used used to winning at some level? We know they're used to working hard. We're no use to those kind of things. So, yeah, I think it's okay for us to, to acknowledge that while the roster's got some issues, this is not Kansas. Plus, you know, the, or, plus or, the facilities you know, are in good shape. Correct. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of infrastructure is there. Right. There's a lot of good things about this program that they've inherited. I think it's important to note. He also notes props to uh, Chris Kleiman for dropping Hunter Ryzen. He asks, where's the outrage over Puka Williams still being at KU? <laughs> difference in the two coaches. Like, I don't know. I'm a little naive. Like, I understand the Puka Williams stuff, but I, to an extent, but I'm not studied up enough on it to really even make a comment on what his deal is. I don't know if anybody else knows more, but not Has me, there been so. a formal announcement one way or the other on Puka? I don't know that there has. That's the interesting thing because 
you know, the Big 12 sent their thing out for, you know, the preseason Big 12 awards. I think there'd probably be some people that would put Puka Williams as one of their running backs. But I, if right. I were to fill one out, I wouldn't put Puka Williams on there because I just don't know if he's going to play or not. But I don't really know the situation. Plus, Les Miles seems like such a wild card right now that I don't think we know what he's going to do or how his disciplinary actions would work out. I don't know. Wild card movie chuckle. There's an always sunny scene where a guy just dives at the back and screams wild card. So I thought of Les Miles doing that. <laughs> Anytime I say wild card, that's what comes to my head. Too. Exactly. Did you think of that too? Okay, oh, good, yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Um, Willie 2007 asked a really good question, asking us one to do a deep dive of the offensive line under Kleiman and really break down that position. I'm not trying to dodge it. As I read it and thought about this the last couple of days looking at this, I think before the season starts, we'll do a ridiculously long, you know, two and a half hour, three hour, whatever pod. We'll get everybody we can to participate where we go position by position, you know, almost like a roster and recruiting center, but verbally spoken by this group. So that's when we'll go, you know, real deep on these sides of the ball. I will answer your other question, though, here. Can you define what, uh, what quote, winning in the KC Metro and Kansas expectations should be? This has been something we've talked about a lot. I'll just ask two of you to speak on it. So maybe Nelson first. You know, what, what does that mean to you? And then Flanders, uh, you know, you're covering basketball recruiting for us, so it's, a, it's not exactly your comfort zone. But when you hear a phrase like, you know, winning Kansas City, what would that mean, you know, for K-State? But Nelson first, winning Kansas City, State of Kansas, what are your expectations to accomplish that? <laughs> Again, I'll answer this from my own personal perspective. I would say in the state of Kansas, if we got, you know, five of the top ten every year, I would probably consider that a success. Yeah. Um, Kansas City, um, that might be harder for me to answer. Um Again, I not to take the easy way out. If I knew who all of our targets were, if we got fifty percent of our targets, then I, you know, I'd consider that a success. Anything totally different from you, Flanda? I mean, not really. Do you want me to take a basketball route on this, or is it supposed That's, to be football? I mean, he's because, asking about football. Yeah, then, yeah, then, yeah. I mean, I'm not much different than that. I mean, you do want to cover as much as Kansas as possible, especially in football, and I think uh, that this staff is trying to do that as much as possible i'd be curious to go ahead nelson that's it and just add one thing and in that 50 percent, if i think you need to land at least one of the top three out of, out of that 10 yeah yeah I, I wouldn't say anything different i think i think when he said that line and some people have read that you know winning kansas or winning kansas city or whatever means getting everybody you want out of there and that's never what he meant by it it's never what it should mean that's not how recruiting works you know you don't get everyone you want out of a certain area but it's okay you know like nelson said to have high expectations for what you want uh, fan, this is a tough one off the top of your head. I and mean, maybe we can just talk through this. And I'd be curious to hear what Nelson says, you know, the older guys like us. <laughs> what do you think a more difficult roster situation and transition has been off the top of our heads? K-State in 08, you know, Snyder taking over for Prince uh, after his few years. Or right now, the situation that Kleinman is taking over for after Snyder. So, again, just kind of off the top of your head, think about what the rosters have. Does one come to mind using a better situation? I would say Prince inherited a better situation than Kleiman is inheriting. Just, I mean, just looking at the running back position alone, um, wide receiver, some of that was out of the, the, this staff's control, so I'm not going to sh- sure. shoot that one up. But defensively, there's some, some holes in the, in the lineup. Offensive line, after this year, there's, there's obviously holes at offensive tackle that have been talked about a lot. So there's some significant holes in the roster that I don't remember being nearly like this the first time around. I would say the same. That's, I mean, again, that's not a fair breakdown. I've gone down to pull up the roster and yep. say, oh, my gosh, I'm wrong. They had nothing at O-Tackle or at tight end or whatever. But same to me. I don't remember seeing – I know quarterback, you know, if you're, especially if you're looking at, you know, uh, Prince to Snyder, they had to go find Grant Gregory and Carson Kaufman and that kind of stuff when at least this team has Skylar Thompson. Yep. But, yeah, I, I think the roster 10, 11 years ago was probably in better shape than it is. Than it Agreed. Is, than it is now. Let's see. This guy, KSU fella, says he does have a question. What do you need to see during training camp that would give you your biggest burst of optimism for the season? So, Mason, if Coach Kleiman just says, you know what, man, come out and watch every every practice in camp. Come watch everyone. Have a good time. Like, what would you need to see to come back to the board or go into K-Man and say, oh, my gosh, guys, this season's going to be different because I just saw. I, I think, to me, I, I still feel okay about how the offense is going to play. I still feel like they can play at a middle of the road Big 12 level, which is I th- I think is probably the best that you can ask for for the situation. To me, I think the thing that would really blow me away was if there were guys mainly 
at the linebacker spot and then in the secondary that seemed really impressive and made me truly <coughs> think that they'd be able to cover guys in the Big 12 and look make K-State look more like a six-win team close to seven because last week on the radio we talked about K-State five closer to six or closer to four. If they could just bump that up one and start to look higher, I think that would be the impressive thing to me. But I think that has to come from the defense, mainly past the defensive line. I agree with the guy. Ema Forever, I'm going to ask all you guys a question here. Says, I don't know how feasible it would be, but it'd be pretty cool if you guys could go back through some of the 100 questions again and get the rest of the group's input. So I'm not going to go back through all of them because we're on question 63, 64. We do 63 <laughs> with you know, four guys' answers. That'd be it. Whew. But he references the P5 games was pretty interesting is what he says. There's a couple other P5 questions that we talked about. So I'm just going to ask you guys' opinion. And this can be short. It can be long. However you want to explain it. One of the questions Scott asked earlier, Scott Wildcat from the Bosco's Boys, um, was do you believe the Big 12 should require every uh, every team to play at least one Power 5 non-conference opponent? The Big 12 does require that at the moment. So kind of a simple yes or no. Do you think that should be qu- required by the league? Pardon me, yes or no? We'll start with Nelson. Just thoughts on a mandatory P5 non-conference game. Not as it, as it exists today with nine conference games in the regular season. Flanders, what do you think? Same, same question to you. Should it be yes, required? Yes, it should be required. Mm-hmm. I like seeing... Power Five game, dummy, right? games <laughs> non conference. I mean, you can play conference every year, but it's good to switch it up at least once in the non con. We're one to one. Let's see what we got here, Mason. So I would say no. I think you leave it up to the teams, <clears throat> and you know what? It can be their funeral if it screws them over in the end, or if it benefits them based off of it. Because you look at it, KU is a team that has no business playing a Power Five team the past oh, couple of years. Rutgers. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're and, absolutely right. And yeah. well, they're barely power five, you know. But I, I think in K State's in a situation this year where if you wouldn't have had to have put Mississippi State on the schedule, you probably don't want them playing Mississippi State because you go in there and you could get maybe a third easy win. You're three and zero to start the year, and then you only have to win three conference games to be bull eligible. So I think you should leave it up to the teams. But I like them playing a power five opponent. I think it makes it more fun. It's better for the schools. And as Nelly said, you know, the big thing is you're only playing nine conference games right now. And I think it's so unbalanced throughout the country that until you get universal, like every conference is going to play nine conference games, then you should implement it. But right now, the Big 12 is kind of at a disadvantage with how their non-conference schedule sets up. So Flando has courage, Mason and Nelson don't. <laughs> you know, where do you where do you fall in this in this argument, Jimmy? I'd, I'd lean toward yes, just because oh, you and Flando. I think <laughs> I think the Big 12 is good, but it's not like half the league is ranked every year. Um, I think for for a brand from a brand standpoint, getting every league team playing a Power Five conference opponent in the non-conference and getting some some good TV games those first three or four weeks that we're playing, I think is good for the league as well. So I think overall it's good. I see I understand the arguments sure. on the other side of it, but I think overall for the league it's it's good to have teams playing mandatory P5s in the non-conference. Two to two, you guys, two to two. I'm well, not agree gonna, to disagree, I agree guess. To, I'm not even going to stick in. my nose in this. I'm just going to move on. Uh, v Shown 87 asks, do you have any feel for what media access will be like during fall camp and or in season? A little bit. I've asked specifically what it's going to be like. Uh, no communication yet on what uh, we'll see from fall camp as far as availability before or after practice or in practice or that kind of thing. As far as in season right now, all I know is – Big 12 coaches teleconference on Monday. Press conferences are likely going to remain on Tuesdays, you know, is what we have been told, fortunately. And they're still talking about whether or not there'll be another day availability after that. They didn't know yet. So it may not look different at all on paper than what it was before. The difference would be, um, you know, those Tuesdays will, would likely include coordinators and assistant coaches and a lot more players than in the past. So the, I don't know the answer to that yet. At, at the moment, I haven't seen anything official that says it's going to be more than it was in the past as far as days or availability. It probably will be, but even if it's not, we're going to have more guys, so that'll be fun. D. Floor asked a question. I'm going to go around the board again. You guys got to pick one. You got to you got to pick one. That's all I've got to say about it. Which is more likely to happen first, you know, so from this point forward? A Big 12 title in men's basketball or, or a football season with eight or more wins? And I'll say regular season wins, just to be clear on the question. So what's going to happen next? K-State wins another Big 12 title in basketball? Or has an eight-plus win football season. Nelson, I always start with you, so let's start with you. <laughs> I feel like I might be on an island here, but I'm going to go eight-plus in football. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going. I'm going the Big Twelve Championship uh, again in basketball. I think that their that their ceiling right now is two, maybe three. But yeah, I think that they could get that number one spot um, over football winning eight games. Fan, watch you cut in front of Mason here, and then we'll get back to Mason. I would just say Bob bet on Bruce. Oh, Bruce, I like it. Bruce has won two titles I already. Like it. Why, the why only would Bruce he not? Hater here. <laughs> why would he not? Why would he not win another title in the next three or four years? Why would he not? It's all he does because he does it once every seven, not three or yeah, four. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's really once every three and a half. It just you know, like it's, I mean, as long as there's not another yeah. roster issue blow up, I mean, he should win one. That's right, Mason. Uh, after hearing that, what do you think? I mean, they're all great points. Uh, <laughs> This one's a tough one because, you know, I really like basketball, and I'm with Flando that this year the ceiling's probably two or three, but if things happen, and I just I do like Bruce a lot and what's going on there, but I'm going to go with eight wins in football. I think that <laughs> yes. happens beforehand just because I think right now it's the same thing with the honeymoon question. I think a lot of people are very high on Chris Kleiman, and I'm buying into it right now, and I'm just going to put a lot of stock in him being a really good football coach until he goes out and proves me wrong. So I would say eight wins happens before another Big 12 basketball two title. Two to two again. I, I like mean, Iowa State won eight there. games in <laughs> I mean, football. That's true. I mean, jeez. If they could. Another note from, another, <laughs> from D. Fleur. He kind of notes that after many visits, kids talk about how blown away they are by their staff, or by K-State staff, but hasn't to pull the trigger due to a lack of proof or less time to build relationships or a combination of both. I would think it's a well-written, and I agree with it for the, for the most part. The only thing I'd push back is I, they have 18 commitments right now. You know what I mean? Like, I, don't, I don't think they're having – I mean, like – and that's a really high number for July 1st, <laughs> July 2nd when you're reading this. So I know I get the point of the question. But I think with that, people are talking about, they're talking about Turner Corcoran or Kai Thomas mm-hmm. or Hayden yeah. Pauls. Like, yes, and you're absolutely right. You know, the, the top, even though I think Kai Thomas might be the eighth best player in the state. But the point is, you're right. The very top guys said they had great visits and didn't go. But I think it's a mistake to put that across the whole recruiting process and say, what's it going to take to get guys? They have 18 commitments from players they want. It doesn't mean their class is going to be great. But they're not having a problem right now getting guys to say yes. We'll learn if they evaluated the right guys or that kind of thing. But to answer the point of the question, what will it take to change perception? You know, I mean, I'll throw up my thought and then I'll probably ask Nelson again. I mean, I, I hate to say that there's one number or one result that does it. I don't think it's winning six games. I don't think it's going to a bowl game. All of those things, things could do it. I think... I think if they win even four or five games, but look incredibly competitive, maybe knock off a top 25 team, maybe beat Kansas, maybe do – I mean, I think there's a million different things, Nelson, that could that could show a recruit, okay, these guys know what they're doing that don't necessarily include winning six or seven games. Yeah, I just think it goes to branding of the entire athletic department, not just football and not that sure. there's certain segments that have always done a good job of, of branding themselves and basketball here the last few jo- or a few years has done a much better job of that but you know that was the one I would say maybe the biggest weakness of, of Coach Snyder was he didn't build a brand very well at, at a time we could have built a brand and it'll take some time to do that well 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 said this next question I'm going to start with I'm going to start with Flando make everyone answer it's from Jay Compton 10, who I also noticed, Mason, you don't have a mic right now, so I'm just going to talk to you about it. But we asked what his questions on the game the other day. When it was Ask Us Anything, it was Jay Compton 10. The question says, football returner, you expect to have a breakout year. When I hear that, I think it means like returning player, not return man. So we're going to guess that. If you cover both with one, you know, if you say, um, you know, Philip Brooks <laughs> and you need to get return kicks and that kind of stuff, you're in good shape. But the point is, so just pick a guy. Doesn't have to be the guy. So don't, you know, don't make that brain hurt too yeah. bad. Pick a returning player you like to have a breakout year and show more than he has so far. Well, I mean, this one might be pretty obvious, but Malik Knowles only played four games last year. He's going to have more production this year, and I think he's gonna be a stud. So Malik Knowles. Do better than Malik Knowles fan, because because he said it was obvious, and I well, think it was a good answer. But if he's going to open, it's him, a great if he's going to open himself up for it, let's make him sound dumb. Come on, <laughs> but, get him. But see, I, I would tend to go toward, and it's it's kind of a returning player, kind of not. I would go with Nick Lenners, just Ooh, because we didn't see him. A, but this is I a could probably just move on. This is a <laughs> this is a tight end featured offense. He's obviously probably the most talented guy they have coming back, and if he's coming back ninety percent healthy from that right. knee, he should be a guy that has a factor just watching what their offense was like I don't, North Dakota State. I don't know if I want to go to you guys now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I will say a little note. Nick Lenner, somebody I've heard in the last four or five days, um, has had a really good set. You know, 
two, three weeks in a row, maybe a month in a row, which is good because that's a big injury like he referenced coming back from. And I started to hear some chatter. He wasn't all the way back from it. So to hear that he's had a good few weeks is very encouraging. So Mason, don't say Nick Linners. Don't say Malik Knowles. Tell me somebody's coming back. You're ready to see breakout. Well, technically, I'd like to say that I'm not sure Malik Knowles counts because in the NCAA's eyes, he's a freshman again. So is he really a <laughs> he's returner? never even played. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure those really count. Yeah. Um, stats count. They should though. throw those stats out. I feel like if, <laughs> yeah. they, if they didn't, re- like if they didn't count, if they didn't, uh, like if they don't count as a year of eligibility, it's, you don't get stats for that. It's like Major League Baseball. He didn't get his service time yet, so he's still a freshman. You know, yeah. he just still won Freshman of the Year or something. Uh, I, I'm gonna go with it's like Ben Simmons when yeah, yeah. yeah. in his this second is, year. That's outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is another one where kind of like Flando, it's probably a little obvious and it'll probably get me booed. But I'm gonna say Skylar Thompson just because. <laughs> <laughs> That's boring as can be. Yeah, probably is. It's going to be another night of bashing on case take yeah. j- yeah. Just oh, because yeah, sure. I think that he's in a situation yeah. where he's going to have, you know, the total confidence of the coaching staff now. I think that goes a long ways, especially with how dicey it looked for him last year. And also, I just think he's probably that good of a quarterback, and it'll be fun to see what happens. But I think the big thing is he's got the full confidence of the coaching staff. I love Skylar Thompson. I wasn't booing Skylar Thompson. I was booing your lame, lame pick of the quarterback. So, Nelson, what finished up with something? Oh, you guys care about the offense. Jeez. Well, these guys, I haven't said one. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking this, defense. I'm, I'm, I'm physical. You know, what? <laughs> hopefully, this just isn't wishful thinking because I do think this guy could be an impact player, make a big difference on the defense. So I'll go with Elijah Sullivan. Okay, very good, very good, very good. Well, you didn't say him, Flanders. Nope. Just thought of him. So, born ploopers. This is a fun question. It says, what is your favorite KSU athletic number? Not player or sport specific. So he means you could say number three because you like Bubba Chapman, Lance Harris, and Nicole Oldie. So, again, I'm not going to hold you to this. And if you say eight, I'm going to say you're the dumbest guy ever, you know. But, like, so favorite K-State sports number. So, like, a combination. I want you to think about it in two ways. Like, how cool does it look for one? And then two, give me a group of guys, like, who wore that number. Even if it's two guys, whatever. Or a female. So Mason, yeah, we haven't brought you up first yet. I know you're not prepared. I know you're just you got got you off guard. Favorite K State sports number? Give me one. Man, uh, that's a tough one, but I think I'm gonna go right now just real quick number twenty mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Cartier Martin, probably my favorite K State basketball player ever, and I think the number twenty also looks really good on the basketball jerseys right now. Xavier Sneed wears it well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with number 20 just without any time to really think about it. Also Mm -hmm. consider number 15. I think that's the number that looks well. I think it's all about showcasing how good the K-State font looks on the basketball uniforms. Football, kind of boring. It's just, you know, lineage of players that you like. So Number 20 in your scorebook, but number one in your heart, says Mason Both Fan, what's a number that that owns your heart? (laughs) (laughs) I'm, it, and it's it's really football only, and it's almost just one guy. But 80, I always think of eighty three and Kevin that's Lockett. okay, man. That was like my guy too. So. I mean, that's the first jersey I ever bought. Everett Burnett. I mean, there's other guys that wore it. A few. Uh, I was trying to think of Everett Dalton Burnett. Schoen, right? Anyone yeah. Here? yeah, yeah. So I mean, eighty three. Lockett kind of ruined that number. Nobody really started it after him. No. Now that you think about it. Yeah, Nelson. <laughs> well, I think the. Easiest answer is number seven. Uh, yeah, with I Bishop agree. and Klein and a, a few Brown. and Mark <laughs> Brown, Tony, Tony Madison, Tony Madison. But I'm gonna go Isaiah Zuber. Uh, didn't a safety yes. wear it back? Uh, Eli, Eli Walker, Kenny McIntyre. Yeah. He was seven, I think. Yeah. But I'm gonna go with Brett Jones. Jones. Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> Parrish Fisher. Who I wow. thought he's gonna be good. Yeah. yeah. But I'm going to go with Tyson Schweiger. <laughs> number, hey, there you go. number two, and again, from any one guy, and that's Chris Canny. Deron Tyler. Yeah, he will. I, well I, would, I would put in a, before Flanders says his, just an um, honorable mention for five Quincy Morgan, Chad May, Alex Clint Delton, Stewart, Eisenwater. Alex Delton, Barry Brown. Barry Brown. Mm-hmm. I wore number five. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, man, summer league team wore number five. Mm-hmm. What do you got, Flanders? Well, I was thinking two, because Cartier Jada, too, looks really mm-hmm. good in that number two. Yeah, it does. But I, I am going to go with seven for all the guys that you've yeah. said. Klein, Bishop, Zuber. <laughs> I'm just, man, I'm surprised. I'm but surprised. seven is also my favorite number, so I kind of... I think it looks the best on K-State football uniform. And it is, seven, yeah. It's, it's hot. I'm a little surprised, and it was the one to give an example. So that's why you didn't do it. But three, as he notes throughout this thread, is loaded. Mm-hmm. You know, L. Roberson, Cam Stokes. Yeah. I mean, I'll stop. I'll stop there, <laughs> <laughs> and we can go on. 
All right, E. Ham asked a good question. You're all going to be up here again. If you could magically acquire any current current college football player, so it doesn't play for K State, and make him immediately eligible for the for K State this year, who would it be, and why? Uh, start with me, and I'll say Tua. As much as I love Skylar Thompson, I would say Tua Tungavailoa from Alabama would be my pick because he's the best player in the country. I'll go C.D. Lamb just because I, love Lamb. I think he can provide a lot <laughs> for you. Him, Returning, yeah. being a wide receiver in K-State, no offense to anybody, needs some wide receiver help right now. And you put no. one pretty solid wide receiver with Skylar Thompson, I think that makes the offense go a long ways, even though we know run, tight ends, fun stuff like that. But you get two dynamic guys like that together, great stuff happens. I'll say I know somebody – who went crazy and voted C.D. Lamb as his preseason Big 12 Player of the Year. How about that? Would that be that? you? I don't know who did it, but Nelson, <laughs> give us a, give us a player. Give us somebody well, out there. Well, I agree. Quarterback makes a pretty big impact on the game, and I'll say a different one than out. you. I'll say Trevor Lawrence. Ooh. Am I, he fits the yeah, yeah, fits the scheme, I think. And I also really like that receiver from Clemson as well. He He's a freak. Oh. I forget his name now, so it doesn't count. Yeah, he already went. So let's go. Let's go with Flando, Bo Scarbo, Dunn at Bama. So well, pick somebody I, else. I was going to go Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. I really was. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. But who's yeah. but who's the best linebacker in the country? I don't. I mean, that's know. that's I'd probably. Who, I mean, I, I mean, I know. I was Kenneth, thinking the same I know thing. Kenneth you know, Murray at Oklahoma. I don't know if he's the best linebacker in the country, but I know he's he was my preseason Big Twelve <laughs> defensive player of the year. But let's uh, go with him. He had twenty eight tackles in one game against Army last year. Oh yeah, yeah, so, you, are you, yeah. You brought him up earlier, and yeah, yeah he's that? he's the guy. Then pick I'm him. I'm sure Clemson has somebody on the end or a linebacker though who mm-hmm. you would love to have. Fan, this is a tough question. Now you gotta go last. So who do you got? Well, I was just looking up <clears throat> linebackers. Devin Bush from Michigan's back, oh, right? Yeah. He's no. pretty good. Or is that? Yeah, he went to the. Steelers, that's the wrong year. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm thinking linebacker. The only other position I would think is a really good running back mm-hmm. just because of this offense. Um, like I said, I don't have I'm trying to think of who's still out there. Huge coming to mind. I mean, oh, you still got their guys, uh, you know, Kennedy yeah. Brooks and Trey Sermon. Um, I'm sure. Puka? Yeah. Puka Williams? Puka Williams. I'm sure. No. <laughs> Uh, is Cam Akers still at Florida State? Is that still a thing? I think so. Is like uh, that is the the Clemson guy? Clemson Travis Etienne still? At yeah, Clemson. I think Etienne's Ent- still there. Um, yeah, He's my, my really national good. college ball knowledge. I'm not gonna lie. Is, <laughs> is bull poop my, right it's now. Not, my, like, it's just I not good. Look, I haven't even right looked. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, we nailed that question. Let's move on to <laughs> to Lot Hall. Uh, if K State has a losing record this year, how long do you give Kleiman to turn it around? What is the minimum record he needs to get to year three or four? And what's the minimum record in year four, he says? Is six and six and just getting in a bowl going to be good enough in year three or four? So a lot of questions in one. Um, I'll rephrase a little bit and ask it to to Jimmy specifically. So so they kick it as a losing season. Let's say they go as bad as four and eight even. Let's just say four and eight. Um, How long do you give Kleiman to turn it around? I guess I'll ask it two questions. One, does that impact how long you give him to turn it around? And two, whether it does or doesn't, how long after one season do you you give him to turn things around? No, the first year, we're all hoping we go six and six and make a bowl game. But honestly, four or five wins is definitely not out of the question just with the holes in the roster. If if we make everything work together and don't have injuries, I'm sure they can piece together six wins. But it's – not really his roster. I mean, right. we make we have this argument all the time, and who's a good and bad coach based on what they do their first or second year. Um, so I, I'd say by year three, you're wanting to see the signs that the roster this staff is building can right. can be maybe a 500 team in year three, even though that could be tough. And then definitely year four should be a breakout year where you – win seven or eight games at minimum that's that's the that's the route i would take i would say the same i mean i know people here are saying i mean i know the people listen to this saying man you're saying six wins i'm just going to put numbers in it to make it simple six wins year three eight year four that's what we're building towards yeah i mean yeah. probably probably so i know that breaks some people's hearts to to hear that and that doesn't mean it can't be a little better than that it doesn't mean that they can't surprise and win six or seven this year and then it doesn't mean you can't hope for all those things but i think if you really look at the roster you understand then in three years, it'll yes, it'll be their roster, but it's going to be a very young roster. So if that team and, is getting better and, and winning would, six or seven and, games, and I would honestly be saying that about any coach we hired, right. like it's not just climbing. It's I'm the same. I, I, yeah. Any coach we hired, I think, would have been on the same same route as far as rebuilding the roster. Is anybody totally di- any totally different? Yeah. Want to add to it, Nelson? No, I just say I might have higher expectations for year two with a returning senior quarterback right. than I do year three. 
I wouldn't. It's true. I think it's fair to say. I think, but see, this is where again we talk all the time about. I know, I know, we're defined in sports as wins and losses, right. and that's how it should be. I get it, but I could absolutely see a scenario where both of you guys are talking about it right, where maybe in year two technically they're a little better. Maybe they win six or seven when year three only wins five or six. But I think you can still feel Kurtz is here, guys. So if he wants to, What's up? you want to walk outside? <laughs> um, no, have a have a seat. We'll bring you in here. Who knows when? Um, yeah, go to the restroom. No one has to know that now. <laughs> so, no, the point is, though, like, I could see a scenario where, yeah, but if that year three team, right, see they'll win five or six games, but they feel faster. They feel like they know what they're doing. They feel like they're more competitive against bigger teams or similar even to year two. I think you could see a scenario where that's a good sign. I just think it's me, everyone wants to hear, and none of you guys force this to happen. Everyone wants to hear, like, this this black and white number of this many wins is failing and this many yeah. wins is, it doesn't exist. Like, it doesn't exist right now. We might know it in, in a year or two or where it's going, but right now, to, to assign a, a hard number to what you expect shows, to me, a lack of, like, understanding for the nuance of the situation and how things can ebb and flow. At some point, you got to win enough, mm, but right now, yeah. Now, hey, this is Neilio says that he understands when more phases of the stadium upgrade to start taking place, the southern end of Snyder Stadium will feature two scoreboard systems in the corners rather than one big board or the southern end. His question is simple. Do you like that idea? And do you know of other stadiums that do this? I don't know of other stadiums. I'm trying to think if there's any stadiums that have four mm-hmm. screens I don't know. just in the four corners. None come to mind for me. But that doesn't at all mean it doesn't exist. It might be super common, and I'm just stupid. Uh, I will say, though, I do prefer the idea of a long video board, one big giant video board in the south, as opposed to four corners. But that's just my preference. Nelson, do you prefer four corners of videos or big dog in the south and then two in the north? Well, if it means another like club level attached to Bramblage in the south, then I prefer the four. Well, that's a good If there's answer. no yeah. club level, then I prefer the one long. <sighs> Pretty good answer. Maybe different. No. See, I would I would say, unless it's some gigantic, biggest, close to the biggest in college football in the end. Yeah. I I tend to I don't even look at the end one anymore. I always I don't anymore the either because the end one is just not as good of a screen and it's not very big. I'm the same. I'm the so same. I think if you put a huge one up there, but I don't see us it doing c- that. It couldn't just be the existing one, which no. I agree with. And if you're going to change it, you're not going to put one that's as big as Oklahoma or Texas or Nebraska on there. Let's go four corners. Yeah, you know, maybe put one of them on two K or something. Oh god, you know that's an idea. <laughs> so that's an idea. Pan Jandrum says, let's assume Climate has enough success in his first two or three years to necessitate an extension for him and his assistants. Let's also assume there's interest from other P five schools. What level of financial support do you believe Gene Taylor is capable of providing and willing to give Climate and his assistants? I mean, that's a that's a great question. It's a big question, and I don't think any of us sitting here. Maybe I'm wrong, and if I am, somebody speak up and tell me. But I don't know that any of us really knows how much money K State's going to have in three years to pony up for assistant, you know, new assistant salaries and new head coaching salaries. I'll say I, I do think, you know, trying to find the right wording. I think they've pretty much spent what they can on this staff. I think you'll see a couple more people as far as you know recruiting help added, maybe as many as three more. So they're not done, but I, I do have some understanding. They don't have you know millions of dollars laying around they could have used extra. So I'd be interested to hear any of their thoughts on this. I think they'll have money. If they're winning, I think Gene Taylor's going to find money to uh, to pay the staff he handpicked to bring in and you know take mm-hmm. uh, replace Bill Snyder. But I don't know how much you know down the road. Well, and a lot of coaches' salaries are funded by donations, and so I know it's Gene's job ultimately to get those donations, but I mean, that will determine how much money we can pay coaches is how much money's flowing in through that. I mean, they, they did... Uh, John Kurtz, everyone. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> 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 um, when they won with Snyder 2.0 and they had the 2011-2012 run, they did pony up and get money from donors to build all the facilities and everything, right? I mean... Now, I guess I I could be off on the timeline a little bit as to when West Stadium Center started. But, I mean, all that felt like it was capitalizing on that momentum. John Curry, I don't want to take anything away from him. He did a great job, and there's certainly a skill into maximizing that. But they ponied up quite a bit of money when they started to see the success was there for football. So I I think that'll happen. Am I not talking into the mic enough? Is that what's happening? The tapping, ta- you could just say it. Doing it's that, table tapping, yeah, yeah, doing yeah. that. If you guys, if you, if you guys hear this sound, just know John Kurtz is thinking. Just think <laughs> that's all. It's just what <laughs> you have to know. Just, I know he's used to it too. A K man, it's hanging, so it's like right there. You can. Yeah, yeah we don't have it. hanging mics, Kurtz. They're just, they're just my a, thinking fingers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Put the wall behind you. I like Flato coming in with the intensity, though. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just just say something next time because I didn't know what you were doing. It felt like when we were at Cayman, we were at Cayman, and Stephen was trying to show me the headphones thing with his head, and we're like, "Just tell us the answer." I don't know what you're trying to tell me to do. That, that was if you I ever know. if you heard of Powercat Game Day during basketball season, where the first twenty seconds were yes. like a combination of silence slash stuff falling over slash like you know headphones banging into the mic. Yeah, Stephen though, uh, man, he went out of his way to really really show stuff. Uh, Dy is not here. This would be a great question for him. But I know what he would say. It's Water, Waterloo 12. He says, is it more gratifying to publish a great recruiting write-up on a commit or more frustrating disregarding an article already written when a recruit commits elsewhere? Then he says some very nice things about the recruiting work. I know what D.Y. would say, and I would agree. It's not it's not that frustrating to delete out a story. Like So it's more exciting to put out good news than it is to lead out bad news there's even times though when i mean like when we joke about and flanders has seen it like when a kid goes elsewhere we say well i guess we can clean up the admin you know what i mean so we'll go through and take out our nine turner corcoran stories and i mean um, that's a good time i will say chubba purdy like i wrote two that day like i had ready to go that were kind of unique because you know four-star quarterback commit like they weren't our generic stuff so deleting those out kind of stung, but for the most part, it's all good. You sure like some of those you don't maybe keep around? I mean, after they that, no, there's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough decision because like the Chubba Purdy ones, for example, like I don't expect him to flip or anything, but I didn't delete them right away. You know I mean? I looked at him and thought, man, well, what if this and what if that and these other guys? I mean, so uh, they'll be, we'll get burned at some point. We'll delete something out that we've put working on and then that guy will flip and we'll say, well... Whatever. Look at his Twitter, you know? I mean, that kind of thing. So, all right. Got three questions here for you guys, and I want to get the whole the whole room again. And I know these are a little bit open-ended, so but answer how you want. We're going to start with Fan. We're going to go Fan. Then we're going to go Mason. Then we're going to go Flanders. Then we're going to go Nelson. Then we're going to go Kurtz. Simple. I, how'd you pick that order? Um, I just, <laughs> listen, man, I don't need to tap my fingers to make a decision. So I just, <laughs> I just made a decision and went with it. So, Fan, where will K-State football be in five years? Where will it be? This is from nine, Ton 25. I'm going to say nine or ten wins. That would be nice. I'd be excited. I'm going to say the buildup by five years is, is in place, and it's Klein's program, and he's competing at a high level because I think he can do it. Yeah, I would say probably that fourth year is probably when they get to seven or eight wins, and then I think from then on they're probably in a situation where they're consistently around seven or eight. And, Nelly, they get those eight wins before I, basketball wins another Big 12 title. So there you that's go. That's five years from now, you're saying. Yeah. Take, hey, it takes time to develop champions, you know. Every 3.5 years. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go eight, nine wins. That's my, my mark. So, I mean, right around the same area. I wouldn't be surprised at 10. Hey, maybe 11. Maybe Big 12 championships at that point. No, I'm not going to go that far. But it could happen. We've got we've got success, 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 Nelson. I've got to stick to my guns. I can't mm. be hypocritical from a previous answer. So, eight plus wins. Kurtz, are we all living in a, in a world where we're back to eight? We're back to eight, nine wins. Well, here, here's what I would say. Thing. Look at it, he learns too. You give him criticism, one answer, you don't hear it again. Oh, I know it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a pro. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say it. We, he will be successful, but I'm also going to say I'd put it six to eight wins because I think if we're being honest with ourselves. Five years from now, if it's a program that's consistently winning six to eight games, I would consider that decently successful. At K State, certainly successful enough to keep your job um, at K State. So, I mean, I I would hope that it's on the higher end, and I almost thought about making it, you know, in true me fashion, six to nine wins. Sure, but uh, I know that that's not really in the spirit of the question Flyers because then I'm just three blanking seconds it too much. Your, but after your joke, you know, I, I think uh, if they are, I mean, like if they're think about so if they're winning eight games a year, like if it's Matt Campbell's Iowa State program in five years, we'll all be. Jump it up and down. I mean, I can hear the people right now that'll be saying, "Oh, you're going to set the bar that low, six to eight wins, and right. that's going to be a success." Like, whatever, man, get real. Like, <laughs> if they have Matt Campbell's program in five years, I will be happy as hell. I'm more with Kurtz. Me and Kurtz can can start a company that's called, you know, Lower in the Bar. And if you <laughs> and if you want to play, what's that game with the bar? You go under Limbo. 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 <laughs> Me and Kurtz can come lower that thing for you all the time. But I'm with him. I mean, but I'll I'll, I'll straddle the fence. But because I think you should want and hope that by year five, you, you feel like once in a while they're popping off and be a nine win year, maybe a ten win year, like stuff like that once in a while. But I'm still with Kurtz. I still think. The, a regular good year is going to be six, seven, eight wins. You know, and you guys didn't say anything that different, but maybe by then they're, you know, they're doing. It. I just think it's tough, 
tough to do. You know, it's tough to do. You look through the league at how many teams are winning nine or ten games a year. One, Oklahoma. You know, I mean, Oklahoma State does it a bunch. They do. You know, and they've done, I mean, really until last year, they did it like four <clears throat> straight years. So that's, I mean, that's a that's a good option to look at. TCU and Baylor have had their stretches. You know, you can do that. I'm not saying, Texas can too, but I think there's not many teams in the Big 12 who are just winning nine, nine or ten every year. I think you set it at a situation where you just look at, be within two games of eight wins every year. Whether that's oh, one year you win ten that's, yeah. or every other year or something you drop down to six but consistently you're within two games of eight and wins. you'd rather be on the higher end of that well that's true you would rather be on the higher end of that. that's a good observation <laughs> i just want to make sure we all understood that i'm a little scared to ask this but it's in here so i'm going to ask it and we'll see how it goes i'm going to start with uh kurtz too um what do you think of bill snyder's celebration going to be happening on july 13th if you want to pass you threw you that pass. thing at if me you, first if you, I, I, I didn't know what to do if you want to pass listen and the reason hey. why we're saying it and the reason why there's even like this question is because it's a hundred dollars for people to attend right. and fifty dollars for former players no, to I go mean, to this thing that's it, why it's a question when i first heard before it was official that they were going to do something where the price was a hundred dollars i mean I, I honestly my thought was just what are they doing nobody's going to be there and and that's not that's not to say that people don't love Bill Snyder, but a hundred dollars ahead. I mean, what you everybody here? Like, what are you paying a hundred dollars to go see? I mean, that's like borderline to me on like a concert. I really want to hundred dollars a person, like that. Yeah. right? Like a hundred dollars a person. But now that I kind of get the picture, it's more dinner, having it spread out on the floor. Like it's mm-hmm. going to be people that have the money to do that. I think that makes sense. I think it's fine. I don't. I don't have a problem with it. I. I, I get that there's already been a lot said and done about Bill Snyder, but if this is it just has the feel to me of a fairly intimate gathering between people that already were connected to him. You look at the list of speakers. Right. It's a lot of people that are very close to him and, and still communicate with him. I don't see what the harm is in, in doing that. So I, I, after my initial reaction, finding out more details about it, which is probably a good lesson to everybody about how we should treat these things, um, even though that doesn't make for the best message board fodder, I, I think it's fine in the end. I would have given the same answer. Does anybody have a significantly different feeling in this event? I want to talk about it. I, I think for the you know fan aspect of it, the people not related to the program directly, I think a hundred dollars is fine because those are the kind of people that want those types of events. You know, somebody like me going and sitting at a dinner and listening to you know people after people speak that doesn't interest me. But that's because I don't have the money to attend those kind of things. The thing that really, the only thing that rubs me the wrong way about it, I would say is the part about making former players pay $50. I feel like they've already given a lot to K-State, and we're in a climate where everybody talks about how student-athletes are already kind of screwed over, and the fact that they paid their dues playing football for you and building K-State into what it is, and you say, you know what? If you want to come celebrate your great coach, give us $50, and you can come join us. If I'm being honest, that's the one that gets me. I'm sure there's an explanation for it. I'm sure if I I voice that, you know, to – Whoever the decision makers, it's, oh, we're doing it for this purpose. So I'm sure there's a thought behind it. But, yeah, I would rather not see on the list that if you played for me, I have to pay $50 to have that dinner there. But that's just my opinion. I agree with that, and maybe I'm just being dumb here. But what happens at 730 when the public can come for free? Isn't that – because can't the public come for free at 730 and sit, like, in the – Regular section six is what I saw, and it's from like mm-hmm. they can enter from seven thirty to seven forty five. Yeah. But from the it was a three paragraph release. I'm not sure I was totally clear on what exactly they'll do at that point. Yeah, and so I, I was gonna again. I'm making all these comments without. I have not talked to anybody about this. It's not really fair for K State to have not been able to give an explanation to to really respond right. to this. My thought would be, I mean, if you're gonna charge former players fifty bucks. Why not charge the people that are coming 150 bucks and let the right. players come for free? Because the person that's going to spend 100 dollars to go to that has 150. I would imagine would be fine spending 150. But. I I agree. I agree. Power Cat Bonanza starts by saying Gene Taylor has not exactly had widespread support and been accused by some of being something of a lame duck AD who's not doing much. Uh, I'll stop right right there. Like, is that? I mean, is that a fair assessment of Gene Taylor? Like, do you, I understand that message board Twitter. There's people who are mad are mad about him, but I, I, mean, I would stop well short of saying that he doesn't have widespread support and it seems a lame duck AD. I guess I ask that question first. Does anybody see that as an appropriate description for him? 
I think maybe there are some of the extremist takes out there that probably view him as that. But that's not how I view him, and I don't think that's how a lot of people view him. I think right now, for whatever reason, people just think he should be out there making these huge, splashy moves. And I would say that he is kind of doing that with the stuff going on with baseball and soccer right now. I just think there isn't much that they can do with basketball and football at the time being. But they got a lot of stuff coming down the pipe. I don't think you know that's necessarily a fair assessment, though. I just think vocal minority. Um, I, I don't. I think there's probably a decent sized chunk of people that are a little skeptical. Sure. But I think the amount that would consider him a lame duck AD. I mean, it's it's the crowd that really hated the Chris Kleiman hire, right. basically, right now. Um, so I think it's I think it's amplified when you are on social media when you're on the message boards. I highly doubt that that's anywhere near. Um, majority of people that actually feel that way and then a further question within the same from powercat bonanza just asks based on your own interactions and possible information you haven't been willing or comfortable to share on here what have your own personal opinions been on the job he's doing you know i i think good i mean i honestly do i know it's a very generic answer um, but i don't know what he's done so far that would lead to someone to being disappointed i'm trying to think if i'm missing something you know, he, he made the decision to keep, you know, Bruce Weber. Uh, I mean, John Curry was already kept him to the point, too. But but I thought he showed confidence in him, and he's been rewarded from since then with an Elite Eight, a Big 12 championship. I'm not a baseball expert, you know, uh, but I, we've, got a couple returns here. Are we've got a couple here. But I think Pete Hughes, I think it's hard to say people. From a casual perspective, you would look at that, I think, after what they did in the Big 12 play and say, bad hire. You know, I don't think that would be the case. But yeah. And climbing, we can't judge, but yeah, you may you, listen. If you're listening to this podcast, we're all guilty. We're all human beings. I did it too. Right. You pretty much already made up your mind. Did you like the climbing hire or not like it? And if you liked it, you probably think Gene Taylor's doing okay. And if you don't, you probably think Gene Taylor's not a good AD. It's probably that simple. I think the thing that's probably hurt him maybe the most is the two hires he has made haven't been sexy hires or sure. what you would define as sexy. And so whether they turn out to be good hires or not, that remains to be seen. But certainly from a sex appeal standpoint, it, it didn't get a lot of excitement from some fans. No doubt about it. Uh, next question from Wabash81 really follows this topic. I'm going to ask Fan first what his perception is. Uh, long story short, Wabash81 praises Chris Kleiman, believes he's done a great job so far, um, said he's pretty much done what he said he was going to do from the start. So he lists off some of Chris Kleiman's accomplishments. So explain to me why is it there are still a few out there who remain negative? Will it be a case of no matter what Kleiman does, there will always be some looking for a negative. I mean, probably. Yes. But yeah, I mean, I think, I, yeah. I mean, it's obvious. There's some. I think it's the culture of of how people view sports now. I mean, I think if you have decided when a coach is hired, they're no good. You're going to stick with it. I think we see yep. it still with Bruce Weber, and we're going to have the same thing in many ways with Kleiman. I mean, if he goes and wins ten games in three years. People are going to say, why didn't he win 11 or why didn't he win 12? So I think it's just the nature of the beast with, with our – I don't think it's unique to us. I just think – Correct, yeah. I think it's the way fans view sports now with, with the way they interact with each other, the way they can interact seemingly and send messages to Kleiman, to Gene, to whoever they want and think their voice is being heard. Uh, so I think that's just the way people are, and I, I just think that's the nature of the beast. 15 text cat where you at or whatever that uh, uh he might be in here somewhere you know see he's a big i think he's a big fan of those guys of uh, of climbing i believe climbing so and Gene. i believe yeah. so um stat cat got a new picture stat cat listen it's a good looking avatar it's on that bo savage number 19 mm-hmm. thing i love it but like it's like i i don't i forget who, i literally <laughs> forget who you are like you could be and i know who stat cat is but like fan could change his avatar on our board of like who's this new guy and like why does he talk about stats all the time like i mean when you change the avatar it's like starting over for me yes, on the site I but agree. it's a fun question and it's something we've talked about a lot uh where do you see college sports in 15 to 20 years? Will it be more like professional sports with the best players openly going to schools who pay them the most, even if it is posed as being paid for their likeness? Uh, I'll just say this. If anyone wants to try to answer that question, we'll go around and do it. But I'll say the best answer I give is I don't know. But I've said two things about this that I think can answer it. I, I, when we were in Naperville in Chicago at a camp, I remember saying that I think in 15 or 20 years, college basketball will be viewed with the same popularity that college baseball does right now. Because I just think that sport's going to go to everyone goes, you know, to the NBA out of high school. Or if they're even marginal, I think you're going to start seeing kids all the time going to Europe out of high school, going to the G League out of high school. Like where baseball, and college baseball obviously still has great players and has great teams. And there's exceptions to everything. And still some fan bases love it. But I just think basketball could be heading that direction. 
The other thing I would say is the question about likenesses. That's my concern. Is like I'm all for players getting paid for their likenesses. I think they deserve mm-hmm. money, but I don't know how you do that because I feel like as soon as you open that up, why 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 did a kid go to UCLA or USC where in theory his likeness is worth this much and they could probably show a stat that says here's what our like I, I think that's a really dangerous thing. I don't have the answer to it, so I don't want to criticize. I don't have the answer, but those are the two things I'm afraid of. Kurtz, what are your thoughts? Anything along those thoughts or different? Just the future of college sports. Yeah. Um- as far as what you're saying, I, I definitely understand the concern. I do think there's an element of that's already kind of existing right now. I mean, why do you go to Alabama? I mean, you know that you're going to get you're exposure right. and you're playing right. games and like all that. I think all the same principles would probably apply uh, just in a different way. So I think it is one of those things that we probably overreact about on the front end as opposed to what we see. I just think I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have a great answer as far as what it's going to look like. I'm just at the point of consequences be damned whatever it's going to be if it's going to help benefit the student athletes and let them make some money off of what they because let's be honest like th- this has just turned into an antiquated system right it's definitely broken uh there are certainly some cracks right now in the whole system that's been built up and as much as i love college football and college basketball and that's what i grew up on that's what got me into sports i also understand some of the injustices with it and how messed up of a system it is So I'm not actually going to be all that upset in general if something were to change drastically with it, because I do think that in the end, that's just it's funny. I was watching um, that documentary on the 2000s. Yeah. Yesterday. Oh, we watched that, too. We were talking about on the show when you were gone. Well, there was there was a part about the the banks, like the financial bailout that happened in whenever that was 2007, 2008. And there were all these people there. People were very upset. And I have no statement on what was right or what was wrong. But there was a faction of people that were upset and like, look, who cares what it would have done to the economy or whatever? They made their bed. Let them lie in it. Right. It's kind of how I feel about this. Like, yeah, it would probably suck if college football isn't really a thing anymore. And that would definitely take away a chunk of my life that I really enjoy. But in the end, probably the just thing. If it means that that's really what's happening uh, for the for the benefit of the players and the student athletes. That's almost that's really similar to what I think I said to Flando and DUI when we're at that that dinner. Where I was like, I'm, I, I was like, I'm admitting it. I'm just selfish. I don't want to lose what I see as current version of college ball and college basketball. But that's completely selfish just because I love them as they are. Like you said, I think it's antiquated. And if we started everything over, right, like it's a good way to ask. Like, if we're going to start this process from scratch for now, would you do it this way? No. This isn't how it would work. So, Nelson, anything anything different you want to throw in that hadn't been said about college sports in the future? I better pass. Okay. I mean, or you could share your opinion on it. I mean, yeah. It seems like you got a good one. Yeah. No one's going to crush you. Nelson. No one's yeah. going to crush you. I'm on the opposite end of this. Well, not completely opposite of the spectrum. You know, if, if we want to talk about um, – increasing the monthly stipend for student athletes things like that i'm all for for Mm -hmm. that you know i i'm not against student athletes getting something um like you said i'm very worried about them getting paid for their likeness for for like you said i mean quarterback of texas is going to get paid his autographs are going to be worth ten thousand dollars with core i I agree for k-state's going to be worth 10 bucks and i know i'm exaggerating but i I, no, i agree at the same point and in my eyes they they already do get value so you just look at this year's NBA draft, Zion Williamson versus the kind of remember his name now, the kid that signed the internship with, with uh, he didn't go to college last oh. year. Oh, he was drafted in the lottery. I can't remember, remember. his name, but yeah, there was a lottery pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So right now, who whose value is worth more to marketing companies, Zion Williamson or this kid who didn't play college basketball last year? Zion for sure. So yeah. Zion got something from going to college, even though he didn't get a degree so right you can go for four years get a degree you know and and college athletes get everything that they deserve i've seen it from the other end of the spectrum so back when i worked at k-state when i heard people complain about the perks student athletes got i was the first one to step up and defend them that hey they work so hard that that they deserve all of this yeah but i think i i I think the difference comes too and it's a good it's a good discussion like like are the rules you know for what we owe Zion Williamson or Trevor Lawrence or or Tua or the superstars, right? I mean, like who are generating hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, like because because they're not getting, at least in maybe my opinion and Kurtz's opinion, 
um, appropriately, what's the word I'm looking for? Paid, I guess, compensated. compensated. Do you have to change the rules for everybody then? Because I would agree. I think there's a huge majority of athletes who probably do value the scholarship they're given, who probably don't bring in a lot of money, you know, per se for their university. So I think that's why I, I don't think you're crazy to say it. I mean, I, I think they should get paid more somehow. But like I said, I don't I don't have the answer and I'm, I am terrified of what that answer means. Here would be my thing. And by the way, I, I mean, I appreciate Nelson's take on it because, yeah. um, I mean, you have an insight to this that I don't. You have seen this up close and personal, what it's actually like, much more so than I have. But it not America kind of based on like capitalism and doggy dog and you go take what's yours and get what you can and who, there are going to be those in this world that have more value because of their skills than others i mean people that grow up loving computer programming and are really gifted in that area they're making a hell of a lot more money than i am despite the fact that i'm gifted and doing something that i love yeah. that's life man <laughs> i mean that's You're doing life. something you love. I'll like, agree with that. Them, <laughs> them's the breaks. Like that's America's all about this capitalist. Like go get it if you're, you know, if you ain't first, you're last. Whatever. Why is the college athletic system the place where like that stops? And it's because it's been grandfathered in, and everybody loves it. And yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of other reasons, but that's obviously a big part of it. What, sorry, I was tapping on the table. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> It's this, an important this topic. Because, he has to think because, about This it. was because yeah. I was making a point. This yeah. is like the judge's gavel. This was not <laughs> thinking fingers. Um, but yeah, like why, you know, I mean, I I know I'm going down kind of a dangerous road there, but why Why are we like that everywhere? But then in college athletics, we're going to, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what makes it in a second, but like this is a good conversation because I'm literally between you two guys. Like I don't want this to go away. Because I do think we underrate when I when I say I don't want college sports to go away the way they are, and I do think we underrate what, with the value of what's given, is to ninety five percent of those athletes, ninety eight, ninety nine, you know, whatever. But that's but I do also say with Kurtz, like as long as there's something in place that says Zion's a great example, you know, and did he get value at Duke? Um, absolutely, he absolutely he did. But he sh- to me he should have had the choice of whether he. W- whether he got value there or not, I don't think debatable. He did get value from there, but he should have had the choice he, of like if he wanted to go do that. He did have the choice. Who forced him to go play college basketball? He could have not gone and played college sure. basketball and got drafted this year. And that, that, that's, you, that's my thing. Do you Dave. think that's a? But you think that's a really a? Is that a good option for the kids? Do you think? Well, if if college basketball is taking advantage of these, and I'm not saying you guys are saying this, right. but I've heard a lot of national people complain about how bad college sports takes advantage of kids. Right. If that's the case, then they are better off not not going and going overseas or going like this kid did and signing with a shoe company right. straight out of high school and getting paid. And I mean, to me, they do have a choice. And for those top two, three, four, five percent of those kids, college may not be the right. best option for them. And to me, that's fine. Right. So the way I look at all this, I think, and, you know, the spirit of the question is, how is this going to look 15 years from now? Right. I would say the talent level isn't going to be as high in college basketball. Football pretty much has to stay the way it is just because 18-year-olds aren't ready to play with 25-year-old grown men in the NFL. But I think the solution's coming with the NBA is going to do away with the one and done. And what I think happens there is, you get to a situation where the real reason when you boil it down why people love college sports is because they get to cheer for their school. It's all about that tie-in you have. Right. So no matter if the talent for K-State has them winning a Big 12 with the guys they had last year with a couple of guys that get shots in the NBA, or if they end up winning the Big 12 25 years from now with the team that flamed out with Marcus Foster, it doesn't matter to them what the actual talent level is. It's about if they're winning relative to what's going on. I think the way that you work on the compensation side of things is is just everybody in college basketball gets a flat rate. You let someone like EA Sports come back in, make college basketball and football video games, and let them say, you know what, we make this much money. Each athlete, so we can use their likeness, gets this. You add to it, and you give a little bit more money and lessen the restrictions restrictions on what it can be spent on for the student athletes. But right now, I don't think I'm with Nelson. I don't think the student athletes are getting just such a raw deal that it's ridiculous because the NCAA likes to tout the number that two percent, less than two percent of student athletes go pro. So that is realistic. So there is 98 percent of these kids that they need to focus on school while they're playing there. And I'll be honest, you know, I obviously don't have the talent to represent K State in a way that they would like, but. 
I paid ten thousand dollars last year to go to K State. Right. It'd be a whole heck of a lot easier for me and my family if I didn't have to pay ten thousand dollars. If I got some free shoes and clothing to wear. So I think there are solutions there. I think they're in a decent spot right now. You could add to it. You can make it better. But I think college sports is going to be fine. I think they could make some changes. But overall, I don't think it's just horrendous. And this is where I'll come in and say, I think, I do. Th- I think there is some truth to that. I also think I think a guy like Nigel Malone comes to mind for me because I remember him. A great career at K State, right? Came in and played. He was pretty outspoken after he left about how he came in. He was pushed into like a sociology degree, a program that was easy and was going to keep him eligible. Sure. You know that's happening all over the place. The value of a college degree is really decreasing in 2019 in America anyway. Uh, I don't think it's worth what it used to be. I think it obviously helps some kids to get in school and structure. And like Byron Pringle, it was great for him. Right. But I think there are other kids where it kind of leaves them high and dry once they're done and put through the machine of, of playing football. And then obviously didn't capitalize on anything during that time span money wise. So I I think it works both ways. I, I just think it's a little bit disingenuous to cover it with a blanket statement and say, hey, for most, for 98 percent, whatever, because look, the system that that's what's gets me about the system like the system is dirty we're seeing all this stuff that's happening in college basketball now we know all these things about college football and the north carolina academic scandal and like we know that that's just scratching the surface of what goes on so to maintain this kind of facade of what idealistically it would be for the byron pringles of the world is at the same time uncovering all this other stuff that's going on that isn't good with it too so I, i think you're I, just to me, it's maybe I'm being too cynical about it, but that's too much of a an idealistic view on what college athletics actually is and is doing right now. I don't think yeah. I, I don't think so at all. I think, and I actually think it's really neat because I think you and Nelson and Mason, and I'd love to hear from Flando and Fan too. Like for the most part, have differing views, and so do I. You know, but I don't think anybody here sat here and said, "Oh, you're stupid for thinking this." And no one has no one has the answer. You know what I mean? I think maybe that's why there's not an answer yet. Is yeah. because for me. When I hear Nelson talking, what I asked him is, I would say I could probably come, I don't have to pick sides, I'm probably a little closer to saying I'm with what Nelson's saying, but my problem to, with that, and when I'm picking nit and, picking nits or whatever, <laughs> is like they don't have another choice. When your other choice is to go work outside of America, that's not the same as a choice you're giving every other person in America like to do their job. When you're telling a 19-year-old kid you can either play college basketball or go to Europe, that's not a choice. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not, I mean, that's not a reasonable replacement for what they could be but, doing, which is playing in the NBA. Right, but that isn't, in my eyes, that's not college basketball. That's not the NCAA's problem that there's not another choice here. I mean, Major League Soccer, for Christ's sakes, which yeah. is on the popular level so far down, has, I mean, Sporting Kansas City takes like 16-year-old kids and puts them in the professional right. academy. Right. There's that avenue for them. So, you know, that's not, in my, in my mind, college basketball's issue that there's in that other league for them to it's go not to their right fault. No, it's not their fault. I, I mean, it's not their fault, but... There uh, are things within yeah. college basketball, though, where they hurt the student-athletes. Because I would agree that there needs to be a better system in place, that there are too many people out there that they get to school, and yeah, you're getting your school paid for, and some of the other stuff that I laid out there that I think is a pretty sweet deal to get. But also, I do understand, as somebody that, you know, when... I'm waiting for a payday at Manhattan Broadcasting Company that for a week I'm just eating ham sandwiches. They're doing a whole heck of a lot more than me than going to class, sitting on my butt, and then talking on the radio for two hours a day. They're busting it from 6 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. They need a little bit more nutrition. You need other things to do. You need a little bit more of a kick in. I think that this, the thing that would be the downfall of college sports would be the schools getting to say, hey, you know what? At Duke for basketball, we can pay uh, $2 million a year. If you want to go to K-State, oh, they agree. can only give yeah. you 1000 But I do think you know if somebody wants to pay Sam Ellinger at Texas – you know, $1,000 for his autograph, he should be able to do that, you know, because that's something where just once he gets there, he blows up. And so I think that's one way to do it. There just isn't a perfect solution like you've talked about. Yeah. And it's so across the board weird because football is different than what you need to do in basketball. And then you have to worry about keeping everybody else That's happy. another question, too, is if you just take care of those yeah. two sports, then what, you know? Well, I, look, here's where I come back to. 
Okay, so you're a swimmer. I, I agree scholarship. with this. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. I agree. Tough bleep, man. That ain't as popular as college football, and it isn't what brings in money. And, and you're not going pro in departments. That. And, like, that's, you know what? They do something that is more valuable in terms of an entertainment standpoint and a money standpoint, which money talks. Sorry. Um, that That's my stance on it, and I think that that's how the rest of America operates. I don't understand why people take this weird stance on that and use that as a crutch. I, hey, I, I can agree, agree with that, I agree though. with you. I think, in a, I think in the world, you're paid for, you know, how much money you can bring in for your company and that kind of stuff. And if you're at a sport, I, it's not to say swimmers don't work. They're every bit as hard as the football player. They may work harder. I don't, but the point is not about how hard they work. Right. It's about, mm -hmm. is your program bringing money into the university? And if it's not, we can't pay you on top of that then. We can't give you a scholarship and room and board and that kind of stuff and then pay you when you're not bringing in money i know uh well, nelson what do you think I'll, I'll just end it with well, yeah. my thoughts on yeah yeah i'm not saying the ncaa is perfect it's broken and i'm all for some changes i love some of the things mason said um so one thing on the scholarships like with swimming or baseball who doesn't have full scholarships a lot right. of the the money that football program does bring in does go to fund those scholarships right. so now if it's a donor paying a kid a thousand dollars for a uh autograph that's one thing but if it's taking money away from from if football is paying kids a salary, then there may not be some schools might not have money to fund Correct. scholarships for swimming or soccer or baseball or whatever it may be. And that's just a side effect that we may be okay with and we may not be okay with. That's but see, and fan, I want to hear what you've been looking up to, but that's I think what the discussion comes down to is we all kind of sit here and know the same side effects are going to happen, you know, if you start paying athletes, whether it's the incident of lay ins, whether it's you know. Texas can pay player more, whether it's, you know, baseball's gone. Those are all scary things. I think the thing that Kurtz is saying, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I kind of feel and I kind of agree is that sucks if that's the case. But unfortunately, for better or worse, that's not why we make decisions. We do what's yeah. right for mm -hmm. the people, not. And is it right for a baseball player? Um, no, but they, you know, it's hard to make an argument. And I know we're using Zion Williamson again, but it's hard to make an argument that that a baseball, a case that baseball player is being taken advantage of, it's pretty easy to make one, whether it's right or wrong, that Zion Williamson is. Um, but yeah. I think, but I think what offends Nelson and a lot of people in this argument is the lack of appreciation for what a college scholarship mm -hmm. is. Because to a lot of people, that's very, very valuable. You know, to some, it's not, but to a lot, it is. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, Th and that's fine, and I I understand, and I, that's why I say like with Nelson, I appreciate him making that point because I know he has seen that differently than I have, and our world experiences are going to shape the way that we view right. things like that but i think uh didn't you just say this the other day matt it's just like we don't yes we're, we're trying to stick to this model the way that it's always been because that's what intercollegiate athletics is that's what ncaa athletics is we aren't still shooting into a peach basket to right. play basketball we've right. we've upgraded things from the way that it was originally done and not just stuck rigidly to this intent of what we it was shoot, supposed we to shoot be threes now even yeah you yeah. know because <laughs> yeah. things change yeah. uh life changes the structure changes and a lot of money changes as well it's and, a tough situation yeah i mean it is because i think two smart people I, could we could what, sit here i want to see what fans been pulling up the see, numbers it, what are you looking at over here it, what do you got to me it comes to me it's it's ideally what's best for the kids, and then part part is like you were saying earlier, Matt. Selfishly, what does it matter to me? Like right. to me, if if we open it up, I think K State drops a big amount as I far as too. our ability to compete on a national level. It's, to me, if you do this in football, I think there's going to be twelve to sixteen teams that are going to have their own division, and then everybody else right. will be almost like a separate division. Basketball may be a little bigger pool at the top. But either way, I I don't see how K State can compete in either of those situations. If you have to have more alumni doling out more money to pay kids what they they want to get, the the issue it, it comes dicey because there's only so many. I mean, only one guy can play quarterback, only one guy can play receiver. But can those schools bring in? Will it go back to more like it was in the '70s and '80s when Nebraska could, could pool 100, yeah. 150 kids? In K State could barely field a team and get 50, 60 guys on their squad. So that's the issue for me as a K State fan is as we struggle to compete budget wise. I mean, we're one of the top bottom 10 P5 schools in budget, just looking at the 
the old result, uh, results from this past year at, what, $86 million, which is a crazy amount of money anyway. Right. But, that's not, but, yeah, but that's we can't not, compete yeah. with Texas at $214 So K-State's million. 86, Texas is $214 million, yes. is that right? Yeah. I mean, the gap between yeah. 1 and 40, we're 45, they're 1. I mean, the gaps, when you start looking at these top schools that are way over $120, $130 million, K-State would just be out. And, and that's why I view it as something where the schools should not be the ones that police the money that gets handed out. It's going to take a group of people that get into the NCAA and say, we're going to revolutionize this. We're going to police the money. And I think it just has to be a flat rate and kind of do it in brackets, you know, to where you say, look, the Power Five conferences, they're going to get this much money for these schools. And then, you know, the non-Power Five FBS schools get this. And then that's probably where it ends. But I just don't think that you can go through it and let, you know, Texas and Alabama and all these schools say, you know what, we got more money than everybody, so we're going to technically out-recruit these guys. Right, and that would be, like, what, what you guys just said, I think would be terrible. I would hate it. It would take away what college football was to me, what college basketball was to me. Uh, but that's kind of the point at the start, is like, even though I would hate it all, I'm still not sure it's not the right thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, for, 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 no, I, I'm here from a... Yeah economical perspective whatever but i yeah officially i would be very sad if we went to a system where yeah we we turn it into a you know a minor league or a, because i think we'd lose what i love but just because i love it that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do and i, I think yeah. after a couple of years of that it would probably get to the point where schools start to say this just isn't sustainable for us so they start to pull out because if you go through a situation where K-State football is having to try and compete and there just isn't even the sliver of a chance that they can have a 2012 season or a 1998 season where they can think about a national championship because that's how it would happen, that after probably four or five years, people would say, well, what are we doing trying to keep right. this up? Let's just let it fold, and then we can finally have a successful you know, minor professional football and basketball league that pays the money, and then three, four years from now, boom, they can go on to the NFL, NBA, make their money there. So I think it would just kind of kill off college athletics. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I view it the same way that I view, talking about 15, 20 years, what's football going to look like? Um, That's a great question, too. Yeah, And I don't like what will be the consequence in the end of us discovering more about cte and brain injuries because i mean look guys like football ain't gonna be around forever i mean i'm pretty convinced yeah, of that yeah, it is. like i am i am pretty damn convinced of that and you know what that sucks and i hate it i'm not gonna stand there and say that that ain't, uh, that's not the right thing to do i yeah. mean we're finding out about brain injuries and the heinous things it does to people like I kind of have to just be like, look, that's Joe, that's the right thing to do. And if it hurts what I enjoy, and this is, you're talking to someone who makes my living life, yeah. off of college sports. But look, them's the breaks, man. I'm not trying to, you know, take advantage of kids. I'm not trying to get brains bashed in. I saw Joe Namath say you could reverse concussions with like a hyperbaric <laughs> chamber or something like that. Oh, yeah? So just saying, put that yeah, in. Yeah, that, that was a compelling video. Yeah. Someone posted it on the board. Yeah, I watched yeah. that too. So, okay, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I bought it. So if we get that working, we get that working. Maybe we, you know, figure out this. I don't Just bring college football back. Give the kids all 100 bucks. <laughs> tell them to do whatever they want with it. <laughs> tell them, don't let college football go away. Like, it's it's fine, you know? I, I will, we didn't move on because the uh, topic's been gone for a long time, but I think Mason said something that really fascinated me. I don't know if I agree with. We'll talk about it a different time. It's like you believe that if everything relatively moves the same, and something like so, if the talent level has dipped for everybody relatively the same, people will still care at the same level. I don't think they will. Like that's the thing that scares me. But I don't know the answer to it. That's a different topic, and that's a, I mean, I probably shouldn't have brought it back up. But I've had that thought too. Is like, what if it is will? F so if that's, I, I just think I think if we all know for a fact that college basketball, for example, the best 200 players who are this age are all in the G League or the NBA, I don't think people will care as much about the results if you know the best 200 18 to 20-year-olds are not in this league. The people on the outside won't, but those are the people that are, you know, the T-shirt fans or Curtsies. the ones, yeah, or the <laughs> ones or the ones that didn't end up going to, you know, a Division 1 school. But Ultimately, I think if you still go to a K-State or any any school that has Division One college basketball or football, I think no matter the product level, you're still going to feel like you want to support and cheer on your school in whatever way you can. So that's why I think that 
college sports is more fan driven right. and school pride driven than a lot of people give it credit for. And I think maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part too, but I just kind of view it that way a little bit more than some. That was a fun discussion. I mean, I know you guys were passionate about it and stuff, but that's but was, I'm glad we did it because that's why there's not an answer to it yet is we can all sit here and and have similar feelings or somewhat different feelings, but all still see the same problems and no one really knows mm-hmm. how to fix it all to where you can we can keep college football, the kids feel like they're being valued enough. All these things are tricky to come to come together. I got a few more questions I'm gonna ask from Powercat underscore B that will wrap up this edition of the KSO show, which is brought to you by Tallgrass Tap House as well as Bourbon and Baker. We're going to dinner there tomorrow night, Flando, on Tuesday. If you're listening to this on Tuesday, we're going there. And Harry's, which you now live above, yes, I believe. So okay. <laughs> All right, so just some rapid fire questions from Powercat B. Um, and I will go, we're gonna go the same order every time. We're gonna go fan. Mason, Flando, Nelson, Kurtz. I won't answer because I just want to be able to not stick my neck out at all. And we'll wrap it up with these questions. Fan, what may surprise Chris Kleiman in this first season moving from FCS to P5? He talks all the time about football, football, and he knows the difference. Like, we know Mm -hmm. he knows the difference. But what's something that maybe until the Bulls start flying and he gets in a game, what do you think, or or maybe it's a program building thing, what do you think is going to surprise him about this big change in levels? Honestly, I think for a guy that has won at the level he's won, not winning all the time. I, I mean, I think he's totally. so used to winning. I mean, he hasn't lost as a head coach hardly at all. And so I don't – I mean, there could be some issues like the depth you need in in one versus the other. But I, I just think at the end of the day, it's going to wear on a guy after he's won and won and won to, to go five and seven or six and six this year and not – be a national championship contender like he's used to. I'm kind of in the same boat. I think my I got two things, but I think they tie in. It's one, yeah, he's going to get onto the onto the field. He's going to get into a game. Probably not, you know, any of the first two. Maybe the third against Mississippi State, but when Oklahoma comes to town and there's a chance that this K State team isn't good enough to hang even within 25 of them, where it goes, wow. This is kind of an odd feeling being down and just how much better they are than my team. And in turn, I think it's showing up to some of these stadiums and looking up and seeing that you've got 50,000 people there rather than how many you can fit into the Fargo Dome and that being the environment you're in. So I think it's just going to be different. And it's all based off of the talent level and the competition. Going to find out here in a second. I agree. I said I wasn't going to talk, but I, of course I am. Somebody asked, it was Scott Wildcat asked a question, but under questions like what will be the biggest yeah, surprise or thing we don't know about this year and I said what Jimmy said is how they're going to handle losing I mean because they're going to mm-hmm. lose games he's like they're like 70 and 6 there's like 69 and 6 as head coach and I know he knows he's going to lose we all know but we all have sat here and played something you know or been competitive in a sport it mattered to us it's different when you actually lose like you can know it's coming but when you have to deal with it it's tough so now this this surprise is probably something he already experienced even maybe before he took the job but going into it seeing like how could how could I mean I mean even like North Dakota State beat K-State years ago, but mm-hmm. how could this FBS program, Power 5 program, be have a roster that could... Com- could it's worse than North yeah, Dakota State. Yeah, State. worse than North Dakota State. Yeah, yeah. basically. And, 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 and have a depth that is just out of this world, not good. So, yeah, that, that to me is something he's already gone through. He already knows it, and he's going to see it even more so on the field this year. I don't, I don't disagree. You go from 85 down to 63, and you probably still think you would yeah. take your last roster. You know, I mean, at some spots at least. And, yeah, that would be surprising. Nelson, do you have anything different? If you don't, it's okay. No, just the the rigors of a Big 12 schedule in game after game. Rigorous. There you go. <laughs> Rigor mortis? Rigor mortis? No, that's the wrong thing. Um, I, I, I think just to – add on to that i mean there might be something with the managing scholarships going from 63 to 85 which is a good i mean it's a good thing it's a good problem to have but just how you manage that relative to your peers but he's so dialed in that i wouldn't imagine that would be too much of a thing i would just say with with losing i mean so much of the program is built on positivity right now um like i was listening to shout out to bosco boys um oh the brad episode yeah i was listening to taylor brad on there and he was they asked him the biggest difference between the program and he was just saying over and over i mean the best thing we have going right now is just everybody's positive there's so much energy what happens when you when you are yeah. two and four you right. know where, where does the energy and the positivity goes because right now that's that's the main difference in the program so that that will be a big time challenge 
Well said, everybody. Fan, what freshman has the best chance at playing a somewhat significant role this Ooh. season? Man. Man, I feel like I, pa- yeah, I, pass I, I, realize, I realize you guys can't see these. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i say one, and you guys can all copy it. You can all say a different one. And I'll, I think it's the easiest one. I think Jax Deneen has the chance of playing. When I say significant role, I think just getting the most snaps. I still think he has a chance to be the starting fullback because I don't know if Adam Harder is going to play fullback or tight end or play both or H-back. So I'd say Jax Deneen. Like, now, significant from, is he going to catch a lot of passes or run for a lot of yards? Probably not. But that's the freshman that I would go with. Mason thinks he has when he wants to throw Well, we already touched on this earlier, but it's going to be Malik Knowles because technically oh. he's going to be a freshman again. Oh. So yes, that's correct. Good job. Proud, proud of you. Anybody else? What fans? Fan doesn't want to just go off the top of his head. He wants to be prepared Young blood or Garber. One of the two, uh, and I and I think young blood, yeah. just based on <gasps> it, it, what I have heard so far. <laughs> Cut in and just steal I, everything. Go, young blood. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy. <laughs> I think I think he came in and made some really impressive plays right away uh, in seven on seven that, that turned some heads. So and it, and it sounded like that even before they lost the two receivers that they did that they had envisioned some kind of a role with him. It just seemed like I had heard more chatter about that than Garber. So that that'd be the reason that I would lean young blood on that. Right yeah, now. and you see them in person. Garber and Youngblood. No disrespect to Garber, but Youngblood looks ready for D one. Youngblood is Garber needs some work still. To Youngblood get big, is I think. thick, and like and yeah, I can't I say mean, any other way. Like he's built in the lower body, like 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 Carby Irvin was. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like if you guys understand what I'm saying. And like I think he, there's a, there's a Sir Mix a Lot song. Correct, there is. So like he is thick through the core area, and uh, but I mean this in a positive way. Like usually you expect this guy's going to come in as a freshman, just rail thin, and he is not. And like yeah. Uh, Everything Kurtz has heard about seven on seven, I, I would just echo all of it. So yeah, young blood. You got anybody else you want to take, pick out of this? Yeah, this is, I like well, all their pictures are in I'm, here now. I'm going similar to what I said before. I could see maybe Connor Fox if they need another well, yeah, tight end. They do. Yeah, I mean, and he's bulked up not a lot. Of, not a lot of depth there. Six five two twenty five. I think he's told D White heavier than that. I want to see like in the so I, I could see him or you know a wild card would be wild card. Um, one of the running backs, maybe maybe Grayson. Yeah. I mean, you never know how that's going to shake out. And those two are the two guys they brought in, so they could have a leg up over returners even. We've talked a lot about – I don't – Power Cat be a lot of respect. I don't think I'm going to ask the what defines success for, for Chris Kleiman in year one just because we've talked so much about it, and I don't think anybody wants to stick a certain number on it. Um, so I'll ask this as the last question of the show. I'm going to skip the Jock Jam ones too because I don't know the answer to that. If they're changing pregame music – what are your expectations for Skylar Thompson going forward? Again, I'm going to leave it very open ended as it's working. We'll go reverse this time. We're going to start with Kurtz. So, Kurtz, I know I know you can't stand Skylar Thompson. I know you wouldn't play him. I understand that. I know, but you don't have a choice. He's your guy for two years. What are your expectations for Skylar Thompson going forward? So, I was looking at uh, Phil Steele's position rankings, and I saw that he had Skylar. Talked to Phil Steele today. Wednesday. Okay. We were talking to Phil Steele. Spoil, so, spoil no, no, no. no. It's fine. We can it's release fine. this you'll, later. You'll, you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> um, but he had K State's quarterback unit ranking at six, and you know, I saw it, and I was like, without even looking at the rest of the league and trying to think, I was like, you know what, like. I, I understand why that happened. The stats were not good last year, and clearly things were really mismanaged. But I think I think he is a guy that can be a top four or five quarterback in the league this year, and I think by the time he's yeah. done, he can be a top three quarterback in the league. Um, it's it's hard to say in the Big 12, hey, I think you're going to be the best quarterback in the league, you know, and you got Oklahoma and Lincoln Riley churning things out. But I, I think he can be a third team, all Big 12, second, third team, all Big 12 kind of quarterback by the time he's done. I really believe in him. I think he's got great talent. We talk so much about stars and stars matter and stuff. I mean, he's got that pedigree, too, of being a four-star recruit. He was higher rated than Chubba Purdy Yep. Um, when there was all the hoopla about Purdy here recently. So for all those reasons, he's bought in more than anybody else. Chris Kleiman has the history now of sending his last two starting quarterbacks to the NFL, his NFL draft picks, and Wentz and Easton Stick. So all those reasons lead me to believe Skylar Thompson can be pretty successful. That's a hell of a good answer, Nelson. I echo his comments. Flando, you want to echo or do you want to add something? I wish you'd just echo. Echo. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not kidding with you, though, Mason. Yeah, the only thing that I'll add to it is, even if Skylar Thompson doesn't end up with hit the official title of an All-Big 12 guy, I think he ends up playing at that level. I think he could even play at it this year. Just it depends on what's around him and how the K-State offense works out. But I think he'll end at that level. Yeah, I'd... I'd, I'd kind of agree with that that 
it's going to depend a lot on his teammates. No doubt. And, and what they can do and if we have some explosion on offense. But I think the benefit of knowing he's the guy will be big for his confidence and allow him to just play and make plays within a new system I think will be pretty refreshing for him and for us as fans to watch. I have nothing different to add. I think you guys nailed it. I'm a big Skylar Thompson guy too, but I think it's going to depend a lot on the pieces around him. And I think I think he'll play at the level Kurt's talked about. I, I just think I'm confident he'll do the best he can. You know, that's a very, very cliche, you know, everyone wins, participation award type answer. But that's my expectation is that he, you know, I, I think we'll be able to say at the end of two years that, you know, Skylar Thompson did what he could. You know, whether that means they won seven or eight games or they won five or six, I think we'll probably say that. So, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I appreciate, you know, Nelson and Kurtz and everyone having that discussion about college sports in the future because I think it's a legitimate topic to discuss. And I think it's cool to have, you know, three or four people who don't all see exactly the same on it discussing that. So that was great. I appreciate everyone taking the time to ask questions on the site for us today. We're going to wrap it up. Thanks to the sponsors at Tallgrass Tap House, Harry's, and Bourbon and Baker. Don't have to wait long for the next edition of the KSO Show. It'll be KSO Retro as we look at 2008 K-State KU basketball. Michael Beasley didn't beat him in Africa, but beat him in Manhattan that night. That'll be next for you. Until then, tell your friends.